Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rotem, and thank you for joining our talk today about GitOps, rollbacks, and database schema changes. So before we begin, a few words about myself. So over the past four years, I've been the CTO and co-founder of a company called Ariga. As part of my job, I have the pleasure of being the co-maintainer of two fairly large open source projects. The first of them is called Ent. Ent is an entity framework for Go. Uh, it was started by my co-founder when he was working at Facebook. Today, it's part of the Linux Foundation. And the second one is called Atlas. Atlas is a database schema management tool, and we will be diving a bit into it in the last portion of this talk. So today we are talking about rollbacks. And rollbacks in the context of the people sitting in this room of software delivery is all about undoing some change or returning the system to a uh, previous stable state. And rollbacks are a very important capability for teams that are doing software delivery. Specifically, when we are looking at a metric that is called MTTR. I'm sure many of you know about this, but to recap, MTTR means the mean time to recover. So we deploy changes. Our developers uh, evolve our application. We deploy it to production. We make configuration changes. We do all sorts of stuff. And at some point, sometimes we have an outage we deploy a bad change. It might be a configuration uh, change, it might be a code problem, it might be something else. But in any case, our system is now suffering from some problem, our business objectives are uh, harmed by this, and we want to fix it. So in general, we have two paths to recovering from an outage. One is to try as the issue, try to look at the metrics, logs, traces, whatever we can uh, to understand what is causing the issue, issue a fix, deploy a new version, and rejoice, our problem is resolved. Alternatively, sometimes we don't have time. Sometimes we don't understand the problem well enough, and we just want to return to the previous known uh, stable version. This is called a rollback. And whatever path your team chooses, if we look on aggregate at the average time that it takes our team to recover from a production outage, we call this the MTTR. And it's a very important metric if you want to provide good service to your uh, reliable service to your customers. Now, implementing an undo button in a client side application like a word processor or a photo editor is not an easy task, but it's pretty straightforward. You need to keep track of the different changes the user makes, and when they hit Command Z, you go back to a previous state. But how is it even possible to roll back a distributed application like the cloud native applications that the people in this room are managing today, which are comprised of hundreds of moving parts, so there is no one component that we can say, let's return that to the last known uh, stable state. Well, to answer that, I want to offer a, a, a look at an idea that is described in the book Accelerate by the authors Nicole Forsgren, um, Jez Humble, and Jean Kim. And they say something like this. It should be possible to provision our environments and build, test, and deploy our software in a fully automated fashion, purely from information stored in source control. And they call this idea comprehensive configuration management. Now, if we have achieved comprehensive configuration management, meaning we can restore our system or provision our system from any specific commit in Git, in theory, rolling back is simply Git revert the commit that you want out and we should be found. We should be fine. But how do we do that in practice? This is an abstract idea. We need a concrete implementation in order to be able to use it in our day-to-day -day lives. 
Well, from this idea, we can see in the past decade, stem two similar uh, ideas. One is infrastructure as code as popularized by projects like Terraform. And the second one that we will be talking about today is GitOps with projects like Argo CD and Flux CD in the CNCF. Now, what GitOps gave us is a concrete strategy and also a set of concrete tools that allow us to provision the system in a stable way from a specific commit in Git. This is why we call it GitOps. And in theory, or uh, actually in many cases also in practice, GitOps gives us a concrete answer of how to do comprehensive configuration management. And if we simply revert a commit, Argo CD or our controller would detect the change, the state is reconciled, and our application is back to the stable version. End of talk. But we know that things are more nuanced and, and more complicated, and I guess that's why you, you chose to attend this talk. So let's see how. We're now starting the second part of the talk, which is about the challenges uh, when we, teams try to apply GitOps in practice and to fully adopt this mentality. So famously, GitOps and Kubernetes in general is super effective at managing stateless resources, like application containers. Think about it, all you need to do to deploy a new version of an application in Kubernetes is to update the deployment object, maybe change the container image or some configuration. Kubernetes detects this, spins up a new replica set, replica set spins up new pods, we run health checks. When everything is determined to be okay, we start destroying the old environment. And this just works great for the stateless components. But what do we do about those uh, stateful workloads, like our database? Or even if our database is running outside of Kubernetes, it still has a database schema that is related to our application. What would happen if we apply the same strategy as we did for containers for our database schema changes? So just as a reminder why this is important and relevant to almost any application, when our data model change, changes, our database schema needs to evolve as well. So for example, if I have a Python class representing a user entity and I want to add a birthday attribute, before deploying my backend code, I have to create this column in the database. Otherwise, there would be an incompatibility between the backend and the database causing an outage. So let's say we could spin up a new database, provision the new schema from scratch, run some health checks, maybe some queries to make sure that they work, and finally, kill our old database. So this would get the job done, but we would probably be out of our own job, so maybe that's not such a great idea. So we need some specialized software, something that is built with databases in mind that would help us to evolve uh, the database schema as our application is evolving. And the most common approach in the industry is something that is called migration tools. Raise your hand if you've ever used a migration tool. Yeah, okay, so just a sanity check for me. So to summarize, I've, my companies in this space, we're, we're building uh, database schema management software, so we've researched a lot into this topic, and the vast, vast majority of tools work with this paradigm, where when I want to initiate a change as a developer, I need to plan a migration. Sometimes I do it in SQL, sometimes I do it in a specialized DSL, sometimes I do it with my uh, programming language, but the concept remains that I need to describe the uh, change in a migration script. And typically, I do one migration script that is named the up migration. So if I'm moving forward, how do I provision the change? And in order to be able to provide a rollback uh, capability, 
most tools also provide a way or demand the developer also plan the inverse operation so that I can go back in time to the previous ver version. A few months ago, my co-founder and good friend Ariel published a blog post titled uh, The Myth of Down Migrations. And excuse uh, Dali too for a wild hallucination on the spelling of the word migration. I tried to get it to spell it right. Didn't work. And in the process of uh, our work in, in Ariga, working on Atlas, we've interviewed over 100 uh, engineering teams about their uh, practices when it comes to managing database schemas. And we found something very interesting, that down migrations are very, very rarely used in production. In local development, sure, it's very convenient to be able to revert a change as I'm experimenting. But in practice, in production, very, very rare. And we uh, tried to dig deep into this topic because it's a very widely accepted um, practice. And we released, when we released Atlas, we released Atlas without down migrations because of various considerations that you will see. And everybody had this ex expectation that if you're doing a migration tool, it needs to have down migrations, yet nobody uses them. So why? First of all, down migrations embody a very naive assumption about the way uh, changes happen. And if you think about it, the way down migrations work is that they assume that all of the up statements were executed successfully. Let me explain this with an example. So suppose our migration from version 4 to version 5 contains three statements. Create table user profiles, alter table users, modify column email text to be not null. We're adding a nullability, a not null constraint. And another create table. Typical migration when we are modifying our data model as our application evolves. When we deploy this, the, the first statement will most likely succeed. But the, the second one actually, in some cases, will fail. And if you think about it, if this table already exists and already contains data, we might get a constraint violation. Basically, we're trying to enforce a not null value on a column that already contains uh, null values. So this will fail. And what will happen to the third statement? It will not run. OK? So our deployment failed. Now we want to roll back to go back to the previous version so we can fix whatever we need to fix and move forward with our lives. So our down migration, the first statement would be drop table user roles, which of course would fail because the third statement in our previous migration was not executed. So now we are stuck in this limbo state. We're not at version 4. We're not at version 5. We tried to go back from 5 to 4, but we're somewhere in this limbo in the middle. Secondly, is that down migrations are an ample, provide an ample, ample opportunity for data loss. And I'll try to explain. If you think about it, quite obvious that the inverse of an additive operation is destructive. And let's see this on a timeline. So suppose we're deploying some change and we created a table. Let's say the migration succeed, the application version rollout succeeded. Everything technically on paper is OK. But we discovered some issue uh, after a few hours. Now, in the interim, the application is up and data is being written into our new table. At some point, for some business reason or some bug we later discover, we decide to roll back the change. Now, if you think about our down migration, what is the down migration from create table is drop table, which of course means that all of the data that was written in these few hours will be lost. So if we naively execute our down migrations without considering the state of the target table, we might end, uh, end up deleting precious data to our business and users. The third thing, which is we are getting closer to, to our actual uh, topic today, is that down migrations are in various ways incompatible with modern CI CD practices. So as we said before, in theory, 
if we accept the, the, the idea of comprehensive configuration management or of GitOps, rolling back to a previous version is simply doing git revert and deploying that commit. However, this does not work for schema migrations. Let me take a sip of water. And why is that? Let's show why using a concrete example with Argo CD. So the Argo CD documentations suggest that we run schema migration using a job that is annotated with a pre-sync hook. What this means is that we create a job. A job is a way to run a one-off pod until it runs to completion. We annotate it with Argo CD annotations with a pre-sync, and we specify a container to execute. This is usually a container that contains our migration tool plus the relevant migrations from the specific git commit that we are deploying. Now, what is supposed to happen, or this will happen correctly for the up migration. The user creates a git commit with a new target version. Argo CD detects the change. The pre-sync job is recognized by Argo CD because of these annotations. The pre-sync job runs before our application is deployed. The migration tool upgrades the database, and we, are, we have arrived at our destination, which is uh, where we want to be. But what happens when we roll back? So let's take a closer look at this container image and consider what will happen. So let's say we were at version four, a commit representing version four, and we have uh, upgraded to, ver to version five. Now we're, we have rolled back. We are trying to run the migration container for the previous version. Now in most migration tools that I know of, the command line uh, the command that we use for up and down migrations is different. So it can be migrate and roll back or migrate up and migrate down, but it's not the same command. Meaning that if we just naively run a job to, to run the migrations for version four, it will not run the rollback command. So we need some mechanism to bake in into this uh, migration image that will be able to understand the context are we in a rollback situation, in which case we need to run the, the, the rollback container or the rollback command, or are we migrating up, in which case we need to run the up uh, migrations? Even if we manage to do that and we insert some script there that inspects the current revision and understands uh, what it needs to do, we still have uh, a bigger problem, which is that the down migrations needed to go back from version 5 to version 4 did not exist in the commit that corresponds to version four. So this container image doesn't contain the instructions needed to go back in time, which of course is very unfortunate. What will happen in practice? Most migration tools will silently ignore the situation. So they will see that the database is already at a more advanced version and will simply do not do anything. This poses two issues. One is that the database is no longer in sync with the information stored in source control, violating the most basic tenet of the GitOps philosophy. The second, which is maybe more severe than a theoretical uh, problem, is that if we want to reconcile the database with the desired state, we actually need to manually intervene. So this typically looks like somebody uh, obtaining direct network access to the database and executing some command or some script to fix the issue, which is, of course, something we want to avoid, especially when this database contains our users' data. So, pretty nasty problem at hand, but luckily, it's not unique to database migration. A similar issue occurs in Kubernetes whenever we try to manage a stateful resource under this declarative resource management paradigm. And some very smart people in our community have managed to distill a design pattern that can actually handle this incompatibility uh, between the two worlds. And this is called the operator pattern. 
So an operator is typically comprised of two important pieces. One, it introduces a new, new CRDs, new custom resources, custom resource definitions, basically extending the Kubernetes API such that we are able to uh, describe new kinds of objects or new kinds of resources that we want to manage from within Kubernetes. Now, extending the API is great, but we actually need something to be able to reconcile or to manage these resources, and that thing is called a controller. A controller is a specialized piece of software that listens to changes for these custom resources in the Kubernetes API and needs to react. It needs to have the, to quantify the operational knowledge needed, for example, to run schema migrations. So today I want to present to you a piece of software that, that I had a pleasure of, of working uh, on one of, on its initial version, and today it's, it's my team that's maintaining, and it's called the Atlas Operator. The Atlas Operator is a Kubernetes operator purpose-built for managing schema changes from within Kubernetes. You can find the source code on GitHub. The operator wraps another project that we manage, which is called Atlas. Atlas lets you manage your database schema as code. We open sourced it in 2021, has uh, quite a large adoption uh, in our industry. And because the operator big bakes in all of the capabilities that come from Atlas, it uh, inherits two very important capabilities. One is a sophisticated migration planner. So it's something that connect, can connect to a target database can read the desired state, and can calculate a safe migration plan to go from point A to point B. And the second one is a migration analysis engine. You can think about it like static code analysis, but for schema migration. So it can look at a set of plan changes and understand, OK, this statement might actually lock this table for writes, which can cause downtime. Or here, this is a breaking change relative to previous versions of our application. So the Atlas operator introduces two CRDs that correspond to two kinds of workflows that are common in, in uh, schema management with Atlas. The first one is called an Atlas schema. Atlas schema is for declarative schema migrations. It has two important parts in the configuration. One is the URL. This is the target database, the connection string to the target database that we are managing. Of course, in your production system, you would store this in secret and not put uh, the credentials in uh, clear text. And the second part is the schema. In this case, we are defining the desired state of the database using the create table statement, but we support various other uh, formats. The desired schema can be stored here in line on the CRD. It can be stored in a config map or in a schema registry in some remote location. The second kind of uh, CRD that we have with our Atlas operator is an Atlas migration, which supports a more classic version migration flow. In here, we still have the URL to the target database, and we uh, reference some config map that contains the actual uh, migration files. In this, here also, we can inline it in the uh, custom resource or reference something that it's stored uh, remotely if we don't want the bloated object in our um, Kubernetes API. Some key features of the operator that make it uh, stand out in the ecosystem. So we have something called lint policies, which allow us to evaluate a specific set of changes if it imposes some, uh, some risk. Diff policies allow us to control uh, define policies that govern the way in which Atlas will plan changes for us. So, for example, if you are using Postgres and you have a large table and you don't want indexes to be created, or you want always indexes to be created concurrently so Postgres doesn't lock your table, you can tell Atlas these policies and it will plan the changes according to what you want. Down migrations are not defined ahead of time. Atlas knows how to look at the migration it's reverting and calculate in line the, uh, the specific statements. Pre-migration checks allow us to check stuff like this table that we're dropping, is it really empty? Can we uh, proceed or not? And 
uh, it integrates with uh, Argo CD sync waves so that you can annotate your schema resources and tell Argo it needs to do the migrations before uh, it upgrades the application so you don't have a period of incompatibility. Okay, it's demo time and like my, uh, the, the previous presenters, it's a pre-recorded demo. Uh, but let's see how rollbacks actually happen with the Atlas operator uh, and Argo CD. So I have here an Argo application. It has a Postgres database and an Atlas schema custom resource. Here I have a very simple table just for this demo, table T1 with one column. I want to add a column to this table. I'm now going to my source code. I'm modifying the custom resource. I'm adding a new uh, column. Hello, KubeCon, a text column. I'm going to create a pull request. This is just so it's e more uh, easy for me to revert it in the UI. Um, later. Once it's ready, I can merge this to my master branch. I'm now going to refresh my application on Argo CD, and you will see that it recognized that this resource has changed. And if we look, we see that the new column was created. Now we're not happy with the change. For whatever reason, we want to revert it. Okay, we go back to our pull request. We hit revert. This is the git revert operation, we're going to merge this code back into Git. Once it is merged, once it is merged, we can resync our application. Argo CD will detect the change. The Atlas operator applies the change. And lo and behold, we have rollbacks with declarative schema management. So before we wrap up, a uh, few advantages of the operator pattern. Why it's better than just blindly running a job. One is the operator codifies operational knowledge. So it has a piece in the code that can understand the difference between up and down. And it knows what it needs to do because it's a different kind of operation. The operator has access to relevant information. It can query the target database to check if a table is empty. It can look in its history, some state that it stores, what the migration directory looked like in the past. It has intelligent diffing capabilities for both declarative and version workflows. It can run safety checks to make sure we don't shoot ourselves in the foot by accident. And also something that we're uh, announcing this week, in some cases, the operator cannot make the final decision for you what you need to do. And there is an ability to uh, integrate approval flows and uh, editing the plans from your side. Key takeaways, stuff that I hope you take home with you. So rollbacks are a critical capability to maintain a low MTTR. In theory, GitOps solves all of this. Simply revert and commit. Database migrations pose a unique challenge, similar to other stateful resources, to the GitOps philosophy. Using existing migration tools gives us a false confidence that we have a way to roll back if we want. But if we look in practice, we see that things are not so bright. And the operator pattern provides us a way to deal with stateful resources. Finally. The Atlas operator can be used to handle schema changes for GitOps workflows. So uh, before we uh, head to questions, thank you a lot for your time. And you can ping me on X. I invite you to try Atlas. And we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Yes. Well, with Atlas, you can configure the way that you want it to deal with a disruptive operation. So there are two strategies, basically, that you can use with Atlas. One is something that we call pre-migration checks. So you can make it such that before Atlas drops, it asserts that the table is empty, in which case it's not really a disruptive operation. And the other thing you can do is you can define a diff policy that in certain situations to omit this uh, drop operation. So you can keep the column around knowing that when you return back up, it's still going to be there. Okay? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, so I know with Argo CD you have your Canary rollouts. Um, is there any way to tie into your Canaries to say like, hey, this is a destructive operation, like don't, you know, like either full promote or don't promote this thing? Like don't do it only part way because like, you know, sometimes when you have to do those destructive operations, you're not going to be able to be in that two world state yep. where you're, you know, either you have to migrate and deploy your code at the same time or you need to roll it all back at the same time. So is there any concept of that? So in general, databases and canary releases are not exactly compatible because typically there is one database. So you can not have, you can do a test on a separate environment. For Atlas, for example, our system, Atlas Cloud is a multi-tenant system. We have a database per tenant, so we can roll out stuff to specific tenants and route traffic by subdomain and do this kind of, but if you have one big database, I don't see how that kind of quantum physics thing, two realities uh, existing in parallel is gonna happen. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I noticed on your website, you have like a list of all the different uh, databases that you can connect to. Um, do you have plans or like a roadmap process for bringing in other database management systems, for example, like Trino or Presto? Uh, great question. We uh, have typically uh, people ask for integrations in the GitHub issue tracker, and we use that kind of as a proxy to evaluate community demand. As uh, yesterday, I was in the startup fest uh, discussing business models and, and open source startups. Uh, so naturally, we are directed by our enterprise deals and customers that kind of tends to set priority. But for example, uh, we added this year integration for ClickHouse, and that was really based on demand and engagement on that issue, and a lot of people asking for it in Discord. Uh, so we had a good, clear signal that there was demand. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Oftentimes with the deployment, uh, we have a lot of schema changes as well as a huge number of data changes, inserts, data manipulations, um, transformations of various types. Um, in addition to that, we may not know that we would want to do a rollback until some period of time within maybe hours after we bring it back up online and we get reports from users that something is significantly wrong. At which time we've had additional data entries put into the database that are important to keep. With this additional complexity, is there any hope in doing a rollback versus just restoring from a snapshot? So it, it, it's, it's a really, really great questions, a question. And I will say that I, when we plan rollbacks, we are looking mostly at the schema changes and we don't have a mechanism yet to write the reverse data script. Also, not all operations are reversible. For example, if you truncate the table, there's no way to restore the data. The, the way that it helps me to think about this is like when you upgrade a piece of software from a vendor. So you know there's a difference between major, minor, and patch, patches. So you expect a patch to be easily rolled backable. But some upgrades are inherently more, more risky. So as an operation team, I think we should have some way to flag these changes that are, we need to be more attentive to and perhaps to think about. My team upgraded some key component in our, in our authorization infrastructure this week. And you know we took the time to plan and most of the time things are just really streamlined but if we can uh, isolate and, and tag specific changes that are going to be really unrolled backable then uh, we should be more careful and more, more perhaps create some uh, snapshot uh, to restore from or, or something that is more specific. Good points, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, as one of the steps in a prior slide, you mentioned that humans be, can be kept in the loop. Yep. I guess I'm wondering the intersection between just approving the PR because it's valid SQL, and if you could elaborate on that human intervention. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'd love to talk about it after, but I will say a few words because we have 30 seconds. So the way I think about it is similar to uh, autonomous vehicles. In fair weather conditions, Lots of uh, cars, autonomous cars today can drive, you know, if there's not super complex traffic or not really bad weather conditions, they can, you know, get, get to the destination. 
but it's, it's very important that when these cars have low confidence score that they're able to achieve the, the test, they, they stop and defer to a human. So in a similar way, we have, uh, you can, can define something called review policies in which you can tell the operator in this set of circumstances or when you find some diagnostic that you think I need to review, the operator stops, the status of the CRD is pending review and there's a mechanism to either edit the plan or approve it. But the operator will say, I'm not sure I can make progress, so for this you know, one of 100 use case, we need an operator to take a look at it. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for staying. I'll be here. If you want Atlas swag, I have some. <laughs> <laughs>